probably not in most cases. So in the situations where you choose to kind of be the bigger person, you choose to be respectful, you choose to kind of not feed into that negativity, that's a situation where somebody would show tolerance. Now, uh, tolerance more on a societal level between different groups of people is about saying, you know, we may have differences, may have differences in our opinions, in our beliefs. Maybe we're of a different nationality. Maybe we're of a different race or gender or sexuality. You know, there may be a lot of differences between us, but we can still treat each other the same way that we want to be treated. So it's about showing people kindness. It's about showing people respect. And it's really that first step towards accepting somebody. Once you can tolerate somebody, once you can respect somebody, then accepting somebody is treating them as equal. Standing up for them when you know they're being mistreated or discriminated against. Really trying to learn about people's experiences and you know, let that influence how you treat people. So tolerance and acceptance are extremely important because when we think about the opposite of tolerance and acceptance, that's hate. And one particular form of hate that I want to zero in on today is discrimination. Now, what I mean when I say discrimination is a legally recognized form of hate. Now, that means, you know, for example, if somebody went to apply for a job and they later found out that they were turned down for that job, not because they weren't qualified, not because they did anything wrong in the interview, but just because they were a woman. That woman would then be able to claim that, you know, this was sexism. I was discriminated against because of my gender. And potentially that employer who turned that woman down for her job because of the gender, because of her gender, potentially could face consequences because that's a legally recognized form of discrimination. Now, you know, discrimination based on gender or sex, that's just one form of discrimination. There are lots of other forms of discrimination as well. And they're all connected to people's identities. So your identities are all of these different things that make you who you are. And discrimination is when people are targeted for those identities. So sexism, that's just one type. I want to think about other identities that people have for a second. You know, somebody's gender, that's part of their identity. What are other things that make a person who they are? What are identities that you guys have? How do you describe yourself? connected to what we believe for a second. Are there things that are important to you that are connected to what you believe? Yeah. Religion. Religion, absolutely. Somebody's faith that they practice, whether they're you know Jewish, Christian, Muslim, Buddhist, maybe they don't practice a faith. Maybe they practice a different faith. You know, somebody's religious beliefs has a big impact on you know how they interact with our world. So that's definitely an important part of society. Do you guys think of any other identities besides somebody's, you know, gender, somebody's uh, religion? Sexual orientation. Yeah, sure. Somebody's sexual orientation. You know, somebody is, you know, straight, gay, bisexual. Maybe somebody's asexual. They don't like anybody. You know, it's who you love, who you decide to have relationships, who you have relationships with. You know, that's an important part of who somebody is. Sometimes we hear about people facing discrimination, like homophobia, for who they decide to, or not who they decide to, but who they, you know, love and have relationships with. Can we think of any other, you know, if you were to describe yourself, maybe, to somebody who had never met you before, never seen you before, how would you describe yourself? What information would you include? Yeah. Your skin color. Did you say your skin color? Sure. So you might include your skin color. You know, that can be connected to our race, our ethnicity. It's also just part of our physical appearance, right? So that's definitely something that can be part of our identity. What other info do you include? Yeah. Your personality, absolutely. You know, how you interact with the world, how you treat other people. You know, are you kind? Are you smart? Are you funny? You know, are these different parts of your personality? Those are all important to who you are. So yeah, that's a good one to bring up. Back here. Your interest in goals. Your interests and goals, absolutely. This is a show of hands. Do we have any athletes in the room? Maybe a few of us. Do we have anybody that likes art or music? Anybody who really likes to play video games? <laughs> right? So people have hobbies. People have things they like to do in their free time. That's definitely an important part of who we are. And I like the idea of, you know, your goals being part of your identity too. Now what grade are all of you in? Eighth grade? So as 
as eighth graders, do you have dreams of what you want to do in high school? Do you have maybe dreams of going to college or what kind of jobs you want to get when you're an adult? So those, you know, those goals, those aspirations, you know, where you see yourself headed in life, that can be an important part of who you are as well. So our identities are complicated. We all have lots of them. And it can be connected to, you know, our goals, our dreams, our hobbies, our personality. Or it can be connected to these big categories about us. Things like our gender, our religion, our sexuality. Other things that are part of people's identity are things like race. So if somebody has a disability, that can be a really important part of their identity. Someone's nationality, you know, where they come from, what languages they speak, you know, the structure of somebody's family. So there are lots of different identities that people can have, and discrimination is when those identities are targeted directly, especially things like race, religion, gender, sexuality. And so discrimination is something that, you know, definitely happened in the past. We'll be talking about that a bit, but it's something that still happens today. That's why it's so important to recognize discrimination, to learn about discrimination, because we're hoping to create a world where people are treated equally no matter who they are, and where people aren't targeted for their identities. Because if you think about some of these identities that we've brought up, things like people's race, you know, the color of their skin, things like people's gender, those are things that people can't really cover up. And other things like people's religion or people's sexuality, those are things that people, you know, people shouldn't have to cover those things. And so instead, you know, when we fight against discrimination, again, we're helping to create a world where people are treated equally no matter who they are and how they identify. Now, that's exactly what people were working towards during the Civil Rights Movement. We think back, you know, 60 years into our American history, we had a movement of, you know, thousands, even millions of people that were fighting for change. Like I mentioned earlier, there were a lot of ways that our country was unequal, especially on the grounds of race leading up to the mid 1900s and so we're going to see in this video that i'm going to show you now some of those systems that people were up against things like segregation things like violence from police and while we're watching this video i want you to just pay attention to any connections you might notice between you know what you see going on in the past here and what you see going on in our world today I think you'll notice while we're watching this film that there's a lot of parallels between some of the activism and some of the activities that people were doing back during the civil rights movement and some things that you may have seen you know happening in the last couple of years so we'll have a little bit of time to talk about the video afterwards but does anyone have any questions before we get started all right i hope you enjoy And you gotta ride. And you gotta ride. And you gotta ride. And you movement that challenged American democracy toward a new vision of itself. We must come to see that the end we seek is a society at peace with itself, a society that can live with its conscience. And that will be a day not of the white man, not of the black man. That will be the day of man as man. Until the 1960s, there existed in America two societies, separate and unequal, one for whites and one for people of color. Liberty and justice, the right to vote, equal protection under the law were guaranteed in the nation's constitution, but were not available to all Americans. I was born into a system that was segregated and uh, denied blacks the right to vote, but also denied women the right to vote. In one corner of the store, uh, sometime in the same corner, there would be a shining fountain for white people to get water to drink. Then in the 
the same corner and another corner of the store that would be speaking for blind people to get water to drink. If you were born into a system that's wrong, whether it's a slave system or whether it's a segregated system, you take it for granted. I came to resent the system of segregation and racial discrimination. I hated the, the system uh, and I wanted to find a way to defy it. I draw the line in the dust and toss the closet before the feet of tyranny, and I say segregation now, segregation tomorrow, and segregation forever. They come in and they sit down. And we're not used to them sitting down beside us because I wasn't raised with them. I never have lived with them, and I'm not going to start now. In the name of God, whom we all revere. In the name of liberty, we hold so dear. In the name of decency, which we all cherish. What is happening in America? <laughs> I don't have the one message as I journey around this country. And it is a message which says that I am convinced that the most potent weapon available to oppress people is a struggle for freedom and justice. It's a weapon of nonviolence. The movement had a way of reaching inside me and bringing out things that I never knew what were there. It had courage and, and, and love for people. That's what many people don't understand about what happened back in the deep south. That, that here I am. That this is my duty. I've got to do something. And God is with me. And if God is with me. How can you move leaning on their you know? I guess our courage came out because we didn't have nothing. And we couldn't lose nothing. But we wanted something for ourselves and for our children. And so we took a chance with our lives. <laughs> that finally we were encountering on a mass scale the evil that had been destroying us on a mass scale. You do not walk away from that. You continue to answer it. Sir, whenever there are men who are in sinful conditions, prayer should be under the gravity of Why don't you pray where you are? Go back down and pray. You think you are, you are uh, Lily White? You think you're not sinful? Well, then go back to your church and pray. Well, sir, can we pray together, you and I? You do your prayer. I do mine, big boy. Don't pray for me. I don't want you to pray for me. You pray for us. Because I don't think your prayers get above your head. Well, will you pray for us? No, I'm not going to pray for you. I'll tell you my finish. You tell you and they serve these people out of here, sir. Don't. Sir, sir, I don't have to love anybody. I don't want to love them. Sir, you do your own love. You love your little niggas. I love who I please. I if you were a black man with one right, that was the right to die, not to live. And we wanted to change that. Kill me now. But you want to kill my children. They all have the right. The doors were open for them. Oh. I just thought during that period there was just too much, too much, too many, too many funerals, and some of us would say, How many more? It's not enough to pin the blame on others. Say this is the problem of one section of the country or another. What are more the facts that we face? A great change is at hand. And our task, our obligation, is to make that revolution, that change, peaceful and constructive for all. 
my freedom is very much entangled with the freedom of every other man. And that if another man is not free, then I'm not free. So I'm fighting for my own freedom. Here. We must come to see that the end we seek is a society at peace with itself, a society that can live with its conscience. That will be a day not of the white man, not of the black man. That will be the day of man as man. However difficult the moment, yes, sir. however frustrating the hour, it will not be long because truth crushed the earth will rise again. How long? Not long. Because no lie can live forever. How long? Not long. Because the arc of the moral universe is long, but it bends towards justice. How long? Not long. Because my eyes have seen the glory of the coming of the Lord. He's trampling out the village where the great two lands are stored. He's loosed the fateful lightning of his terrible swift sword. His truth is marching on. Glory, hallelujah. Glory, hallelujah. Glory, hallelujah. Glory, hallelujah. His truth is marching on. All righty, so hopefully that bell taught you something new, or at least jogged your memory a little bit if you've already learned about the civil rights movement. Now, does anyone have any questions about anything that you saw in the film? All righty, then I want you to think about these words I have here on the screen in front of you. Uh, we hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal. Just as a quick show of hands, does anyone recognize these words? Have you heard them, read them anywhere before? Awesome, so quite a few of us. If you haven't, that's okay too. Uh, what's important to know is that these come from one of the most influential documents in the history of the United States. Just like it says here in front of you, the Declaration of Independence. And this was obviously the document where our founding fathers declared independence from Great Britain. This was the document that essentially helped create the United States. Said we're going to create a new country and here's a little bit of what we want this new country to look like now when you read over these words we hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal what message do you think the founding fathers were trying to get across there what do you see these words saying back in the back here all people are created equally all people are created equally right i mean it's kind of right there anyone want to add to that what do you see in these words message do you get out of this? Yeah, Yeah, people should have equal opportunities. And I would argue also, you know, equal rights, equal treatment. So if people are, you know, born equal, people deserve, you know, equality. Then think about the history of our country. Why haven't we ever lived up to this? Has the United States ever been a place where people, where all people are guaranteed the exact same rights, the exact same freedoms, the exact same treatment? I think it's clear, even just from what we saw in the video, that the answer is no. Well, there have been lots of different examples of people being treated unequally right here in the United States. Now let's jump to what we saw in the video. I think it was pretty clear that people were up against a lot of discrimination and inequality during the civil rights movement. What types of discrimination and inequality did you see happening in the video? What scenes or images stuck out to you? Yeah, go ahead. Uh, Martin Luther King's speech. Martin Luther King's speech? Yes. Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, part of the reason why the civil rights movement was able to, you know, spread so far, reach so many people, part of the reason why so many people got involved is because people were seeing these types of things on the news. You know, the 1950s, 1960s, that was around the time where a lot of Americans were getting TVs in their homes. And so imagine seeing, you know, part of Martin Luther King's speech on TV. Imagine seeing some of these clips that we saw in this documentary, you know, in your very own living room. You can see how people, you know, started to get inspired to get involved in this movement 
in ways that they hadn't been before. You know, was able to spread much farther. We can see how inspiring Dr. Martin Luther King's words were for activists and protesters to go out and try to make change. Now let's think about those, you know, activists and protesters for a second. We saw quite a few clips of, you know, people protesting. And how were those protesters actually treated? What did we see being done to them? Yeah, down here. They were being abused. Being abused, right? What did we see people, you know, doing to the protesters? Yeah. Firefighters were using water to push um, African Americans back. Yeah, so we saw people being sprayed with fire hoses. Did you guys notice any other scenes of protesters? Yeah. I think the clip that stands out to me was the gentleman that was talking to the sheriff. I want to say or the cop was the sheriff. Um, and he was politely asking them to pray for us. And that gentleman, in return, wanted to have nothing to do with it. More or less, degrading him or even asking. Yeah, absolutely. And I think the most important thing to keep in mind about, you know, the activists that we saw in the video, you know, even we, even though we saw them being abused and treated in a really cruel way, they were peaceful protesters. They weren't doing anything wrong. You know, our U.S. Constitution, another very important document from our history, guarantees people what we call the right to assembly, you know, the right to gather peacefully in public areas, and the freedom of speech, you know, the freedom to share your opinions and speak out. And so here we have a young activist in this video, in this confrontation between this police officer and this young man. And uh, that boy in the video's name was Jimmy Webb. Now he actually was only 16 years old when that video was recorded. Now imagine somebody that's, you know, not all that much older than yourselves being in that situation. Think about how calm he was when he was asking that officer to pray with him. Now this was a pretty common strategy that, you know, peaceful activists would use, you know, asking to pray together. Because our society was really segregated, really separated uh, between people of different races. But they at least were both Christians. They both believed in the same God. And so in theory, they could have prayed together. That would have been some common ground that they had together. Maybe a way they could find peace. And yeah, I want you to think about that officer's words for a second. Saying, you know, I don't think your prayers get above your head. Didn't even view him as an equal in that regard. Now think of his other words, you know, calling him the N-word, saying, I don't have to love anyone I don't want to love. Think about how that officer's attitudes are reflected in the words that he used towards Jimmy Webb. Think about how resistant that officer was to the change that was happening around him, to the message that Jimmy Webb and his fellow activists were spreading. You know, that officer wasn't the only person out there with those views. There were millions of other people just like him whose minds had to change during this time. So, you know, there were lots of laws and systems that had to change during the civil rights movement. We also had to change individuals as well. That's something we could argue is still happening even today. You know, there's still people with deeply hateful views. Now, I want to go back to, you know, the more clips that we saw of the activists. You know, you mentioned we saw them getting sprayed with fire hoses. We saw another group of people having the American flag taken out of their hands. Does anyone have a guess at what was happening in that scene? What was being done to those protesters? Yeah. They were being uh, violently hurt, uh, and uh, they were take, they were being their, they were getting their freedom taken away from them. Yeah. So people were being you know violently hurt. We saw some folks of people being you know trampled over and beat. And the people having the flags taken away from them were actually being arrested. They were being loaded onto a police van and taken to jail. I want you to think about what I mentioned earlier. You know, peaceful protesters were within their rights. They weren't doing anything wrong. And yet they were in a situation where they could be physically harmed, they could be arrested, and some even lost their lives. I think the most famous instance of this is that, you know, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. himself was assassinated in, the, in 1968 simply for you know, his leadership and his you know, activities during the civil rights movement. Now, you know, protesters were in a situation where they could be hurt, they could be arrested, they could be killed. And yet, why do you guys think that so many people stayed involved? Why do you think that people got involved when it was so dangerous? They cared about the cause. Right, yeah, they cared about the cause. 
know, it was an important fight. Think about the, the ways that people were discriminated against during this time. Think about the rights and freedoms people were fighting for. It must have been pretty darn important if people were willing to face that danger, potentially even losing their lives to make that change happen. So certainly if we think about the way activists and protesters were treated, you know, peaceful activists just trying to make change, that's one way that we see that discrimination showing up. What about segregation? That's another, you know, major form of discrimination that we saw happening in the video. Uh, what forms of discrimination or discrimination? Segregation did you notice um, showing up in the video? What examples did you see? Yeah. Different, different drinking fountains. And I think those drinking fountains are a really clear kind of illustration of what segregation looked like in practice. Because he described the drinking fountain for white people as shining. You know, it was clean. It was, in the pictures we saw, pretty similar to a water fountain we'd see today. But he described the drinking fountain for black people as a spigot. You know, what you have a hose up to on the side of a house. Now, people called the system of segregation separate but equal. They said, oh, we'll have separate places. We'll have separate facilities for people of different races. But don't worry, they'll be equal. It'll be fair. Don't worry. But just think about how those drinking fountains look. Think about how unequal those were. You know, it went further than drinking fountains. Other places were unequal as well. What else did you notice that was segregated in the video? What did you see? Yeah, restaurants. Restaurants, absolutely, yeah. Did you see anything else that was segregated? Or anything else that you maybe learned about before? Yeah. Buses. Buses? Yeah, buses, absolutely. Uh, who here has heard the story of Rosa Parks? Yeah, a lot of us have. You know, and maybe one of the very first stories that you learned about the civil rights movement. Rosa Parks was somebody who refused to give up her seat on a segregated bus. Now, buses were segregated in the sense that black people had to sit at the back of the bus, white people got to sit at the front of the bus. Rosa Parks actually refused to give up her seat, um, and she was arrested for that act. It was illegal to go against this system. But she helped inspire what we call the Montgomery bus boycotts. Now, you know, thousands of people in the city of Montgomery, Alabama, actually stopped riding the buses, put economic pressure on that bus system. Now that pressure eventually got so much that they desegregated the buses. And so Rosa Parks, you know, she was really influential when we're thinking about you know, how segregation started to come to an end here in the United States. Now, did you notice anything else that was segregated in the video? Yeah. Restrooms. Restrooms? Yeah. Yeah, bathrooms as well. Yeah. Sorry? Schools. Schools, definitely. Um, you know, there's a really famous clip in the video of a young girl about this tall being walked up some stairs to a school. Did anyone recognize that clip? Maybe a couple of us? Um, so that girl's name was Ruby Bridges. Now, Ruby Bridges was six years old in that video, so significantly younger than you guys even during the civil rights movement while this was going on. And she was actually the first black student in her city to attend what had once been an all-white school. Now, this definitely wasn't an easy process for Ruby Bridges. There were times where she was the only student in her classroom with her teacher. All of the parents who had white students in her classroom pulled their students out of her class. They didn't want their kids attending class with somebody of a different race. The people that were walking her up those stairs were actually federal marshals that were there to protect her safety, just to go inside and get an education. Now, this was an elementary school student, six years old. Interestingly enough, uh, Ruby Bridges is still around today. She's, I believe, 67 or 68. She's, she's maybe only, you know, around your grandma's grandparents' age, maybe even a little younger. That goes to show us, you know, this wasn't really happening that long ago. And so this system of segregation, now that was one of the biggest things that changed because of the civil rights movement. So I want you to think about what our public spaces look like today. It's pretty radically different from the types of spaces that we saw in the video. There were a couple of other major changes that happened during the civil rights movement as well. So for example, we had a case called Loving versus Virginia that gave marriage rights to more people. In many states, uh, it was not legal to marry somebody of a different race. So it wasn't until 1962 in many states that you know, a white person and a black person were able to get married in many states, especially in the South. Things like voting rights. We had the Voting Rights Act of 1965 that gave many more people of color the right to vote, barred racial discrimination in voting. So our world moved forward in a lot of ways you know, during the 1960s, especially. But I want you to think about our world today. You know, we're 60 years later. Do you guys think that we're living up to this yet in our country? That we're treating everybody equally, guaranteeing everybody equal rights? 
and seeing a few people shake their heads. You know, we talked about discrimination earlier. What forms of discrimination exist in the U.S. today? Yeah. Asian hate. Sorry? Asian hate. Asian hate, absolutely. You know, another form of racism that definitely exists. You know, in the last couple of years, there's been a huge rise in violence against the Asian community here in the United States. And that's because people are buying into false information and stereotypes about Asian people connecting with the coronavirus. And that information is absolutely not true. You know, somebody is not responsible for a pandemic just because they happen to be of a certain race. But when people believe in those stereotypes and believe in that false information, we can see how that might start to influence how they treat people in a real way. So we've also seen, you know, people fighting against that too. I don't know if anyone's seen on social media with the Stop Asian Hate campaign. And people are trying to raise awareness that this is happening and it's something that we should take seriously. So yeah, that's a really important example to bring up. What other forms of you know, hate or discrimination happen to people today? What other groups of people experience this treatment? While you were watching this video, did it remind you of anything that you've seen maybe on social media or in the news? George Floyd. After George Floyd, right? You know, think about last summer. Think about the summer of 2020. First of all, who here saw something about those protests on social media on the news? Most, if not all of us, right? It was everywhere for a couple of months. And I want you to think back to my comment I made earlier about, you know, television being one of the ways that, you know, Martin Luther King and the civil rights movement were able to spread so far. That's similar to what we saw happening last summer, but through social media instead. You know, it's connecting us in ways we've never been connected before. And so people seeing, you know, the George Floyd video on social media, people seeing um, clips of people protesting, we can see how that's starting to get more people, you know, glued into what this movement was talking about. Now, you know, people during those uh, protests, what were they actually protesting against? Does anyone remember? Yeah. The police. The police, right? Police brutality. And that's the idea that um, you know people of color, especially uh, black men, have a much higher risk of having negative or violent encounters with police. And so we had people that were recognizing a specific racist issue, something that needed to change. And just like we had regular people taking to the streets and sharing their voices you know, during the civil rights movement, we had people doing the same thing last summer as well. And so it's important to start kind of making those connections between you know, what happened in our past and what's actually going on in our present, this history does repeat itself a little bit. So it's important to recognize where that's happening. So we've called a couple of examples of, you know, racism happening in this country. Are there other forms of discrimination besides racism that happen to people here? Trans people. Trans people, sure. You know, transgender people, people whose, you know, gender they identify with is different than the sex that they were born with. Um, you know, they experience a lot of pain in this country from, you know, being denied medical care to, you know, transgender women in particular face much higher levels of violence than the average population. So that's another community that, you know, is still to this day, you know, trying to find their voice and trying to fight for change today. Now, the LGBTQ community, you know, more broadly, we also have you know, lesbian, gay, and bisexual people as well. Um, and they've experienced a lot of discrimination throughout our history as well. You know, in the last 50 years, we've seen, you know, a much kind of more active gay rights movement in this country. But it wasn't until 2015 that gay marriage was legalized across the United States. Things like protections in the workplace for LGBT people weren't put in place nationwide until 2020, which meant that in many states, uh, you could be fired for being gay or being transgender, and that wasn't necessarily uh, considered a recognized form of discrimination. Think about that. That was about a year ago that we had those protections put in place. So discrimination and hate, these are things that still happen to people. They still happen to a lot of different communities. Lots of different identities are targeted. People are targeted for who they are. You know, it's important to recognize where discrimination is happening in our world. You know, keep yourself informed about what's going on here in the United States and around the world as well. Because the more that we're informed, the more that we're having these conversations, the more we can change our world for the better. You guys are ordinary students, but you have a lot of power to make your world a better place. And that's a power that I hope you, you know, continue to exercise. 
Now, in these last couple of minutes, I want to actually do an activity with you guys. I'm going to have you write down one strategy that you can use in your own everyday lives to make your world a better place. So I'm going to hand out some note cards down each row. And on these note cards, I want you to write down one thing that you can do to make a difference. Now, this doesn't have to be a big gesture. It can be things like how you treat other people, getting involved in your community, ways to keep yourself educated. So while I'm handing these out, just take a second to think about, you know, your strategy, what you're going to do to make a difference. Um, there may be sex shares, you can hand them down to me on the way down. So I'm gonna hand these sheets down, take an entire packet and then pass it down the stack of packets to the person next to you. Passing them out, I can tell my yeah, story of an example, something good that, that I did. Well, about six years ago, uh, one of my co-workers in Naperville was make, making anti-Muslim statements. She was uh, using the excuse that they were going to build a library, not a mosque, but a library next door to her farm. Anyway, so she was saying very hateful things about Muslims at work. And I had to raise a formal complaint. I had to make a complaint in writing, which again shows that, you know, even when you're not a powerful person, there's your, your, not only just your vote, but things that you can do to uh, make this get better. Absolutely. Writing down one thing that you can do to make a difference. Another minute if you're done writing. Otherwise, I want you to take off the top sheet of your notepad um, and then hand me down the extra sheets. Keep your one that you wrote on, um, but hand down the rest of the extras. Keep yours, pass it back. Yeah, so keep your note card, but uh, just pass down the rest of the packet. Thanks. <laughs> And then now we're, well, we're passing back these last few uh, uh, extras. Does anyone want to share what you wrote down on your note card? What strategy did you come up with to make a difference? Yeah, get us started. Uh, be a better person and show others to do the same. Could you say a bit louder? Uh, be a better person and show others to be better as well. I love that idea. Try to be a better person. Make an active effort to be a good person and encourage other people to be a good person as well. Great idea. Yeah, what are your other strategies for making a difference? What else can you do to make your world a better place? Anyone else want to share what they wrote down? Yeah, go ahead. Supporting people with different interests, absolutely. 
you know, one of the best things that you can do in this world is make connections with people that are different from you. People may have different opinions, people may have different backgrounds, different interests, but you know, there's a lot of strength in you know connecting with people that are different from you, and our differences are important as well. Yeah. Absolutely. You know, going back to this idea of treating others how you want to be treated. You know, showing kindness to people, no matter whether they're different from you, no matter whether they're the same, it's important. One of the best ways that we can, you know, fight for a better world is just to treat everybody equally. You know, I hope you guys are thinking about this as you're leaving the bus, as you're going throughout your day. You know, more strategies, more things that you can do to make a really big impact in your world. Whether it's, you know, just thinking about how you treat other people, that's extremely important how you talk to other people, whether it's, you know, getting involved with clubs or volunteering, finding ways to get active that way. Even just keeping yourself informed about what's going on in our world has a lot of power. You know, the more you're informed, the more you can stand up when you know things are going wrong. So I thank you all for being such a great group today. I know it was an early session, but I really appreciate you guys sitting through this conversation with me. So on your way out, I'm going to ask you to drop your pens in this box here down on this shelf. And then as far as your sticky notes, so you're welcome to take it with you if you'd prefer. Otherwise, you can stick it on here or up here um, on your way out. And that way, you know, classmates that are coming to later sessions can, you know, read your responses and get inspired too. Um, so any last questions before we head out? Alrighty, so thank you for being such a great group. We're going to go ahead and have the first row stand up first and we're going to see some more.